Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you guys for joining us for this month's Digging In with TPS MTSU. We're really excited to have you join us for um, this month's conversation. Um, so a couple of quick things as we get started. As always, again, we are recording these for inclusion on our YouTube channel. So if you're joining us live, be sure to keep your mics muted just so we have a nice, clean audio. Um, also, be sure we see your first and last names in the chat box. Um, and uh, again, open that chat box, introduce yourselves, feel free to ask questions, uh, you know, make comments throughout the session. Um, we are uh, monitoring that and we'll be responding to questions and things that we see there. Um, as always, if you've not had a chance to join us live, we invite you to do so because we do like to make these sessions as interactive as possible. And so that's one of the treats to being able uh, to join live is that you get to kind of again, interact with us and with um, our other participants. So with this series, of course, we do have a Padlet page where you can find all of the resources for today's session, as well as for all of the previous sessions in the Digging In series. And we'll show you guys this link again and the QR code again at the end of the session. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Stacy to talk to us about our theme this month. Thanks, Kira. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. And there, hopefully everybody can see a copy of the newsletter. Um, we chose Turning Points in U.S. History. Turning Points in History, of course, is the theme for this year's History Day competitions. And uh, we are now very much even more enmeshed in History Day than before. And uh, Kira has written about that, and I'll let her tell us a little bit more about that later on, uh, in the featured feature for this month's issue. Uh, so as always, we have additional resources that we will touch on at the end, but basically turning points in U.S. history are kind of concrete events or decisions um, or something that happens in a short period of time that has a change that is usually pretty immediate, um, but also a longer term impact something that changes the course of history, even if it's just kind of, you know, one particular subset of history. So we have um, picked some of more obvious kinds of turning points for this issue, as well as some that might be a little bit more obscure uh, to just kind of help you brainstorm with your students the kinds of things that they can do. And so, first of all, the awesome source of the month is a declaration of intention for Albert Einstein to become a citizen of the United States. And that in itself doesn't sound like a turning point, but when you think about his work um, leading to the creation of the atomic bomb in the United States as a war measure and the way that he pushed FDR to do this kind of research in the United States before the Germans did, um, it really changed things both for the war effort and for uh, just kind of creating a whole um, school of physicists and students um, that were working on these kinds of things and making related breakthroughs uh, in the middle of the 20th century. So that was kind of cool. Okay. So uh, we're gonna be going through some lesson plans, uh, just basically in the order that they come, but also don't forget that we have additional turning points that we put on page four, having to do with westward expansion. Um, that's a bit more of a kind of change over time turning point, uh, but maybe your students can make an argument for that because we thought it was, it definitely changed the course of the United States. Um, black codes, uh, the development of railroads and the Vietnam War protests for something that came more recently. So what I'm going to do is I am going to turn it back to Kira so she can talk about FDR and his decision to run for a third presidential term. Thank you, Stacy. So when we were, again, kind of thinking about, you know, this topic and thinking about, um, you know, what 
ideas that we might cover, what topics. Um, one thing that come up with me is, you know, the 22nd Amendment. I know we've kind of touched on a lot of New Deal, World War II related topics um, over the last year or so. Um, but one thing that I had never really thought about was the decision for FDR to run for a third term. Um, you know, we just, you know, think of him as the guy who run and won four times, um, and longest serving U.S. president. And of course, we know that one of the results of that, of course, is that we get a constitutional amendment that institutes term limits for presidents. But to really kind of dig into like, well, what caused him to run for this third term? Like, what was the thinking? What was the, the turning point that made that happen? Um, and so I, I started doing a little digging to see what I could find on the Library of Congress website, and I found some really cool stuff. So um, one, of course, he is the first president to successfully run for a third term. Um, now, the thing about that is he was not the first one to try to do it. Um, you know, oftentimes we talk about, of course, that you know, George Washington set this president uh, with his farewell address of only serving two terms and then walking away. Thomas Jefferson kind of reinforced that. But then we actually had some presidents in the middle of the 19th century who tried to run for a third term. So this includes Ulysses S. Grant, James Garfield, Grover Cleveland, and of course, Theodore Roosevelt. Now, what's interesting about all of those cases is that it was their parties that prevented them from successfully running for a third term. Every one of them could not get party support to do that. Um, so, uh, you know, so that's kind of an interesting thing to think about that it wasn't necessarily, um, the, uh, the opposing political parties or even voters, but their own, uh, parties that pre prevented that third term run. So again, that's another thing that makes, you know, FDR a little unique in that, you know, he had party support to do that. And of course we know, of course, it's this controversy, uh, around him, you know, serving for four terms or at least for three and a part of a fourth before he dies, um, leads us to the passage of the 22nd Amendment. So it got me into thinking again, well, why? Why did he make this decision? Um, and so I found a couple of interesting things uh, to get into some background on that, a couple of things that I linked to in the, the newsletter, uh, some articles from the Constitution Center. Um, there is one, if you have some time, uh, there is a historian, Richard Moe, who wrote this book, Roosevelt's Second Act, the election of 1940 and the politics of war. And the library has a lecture that he gave there at the Library of Congress uh, available to watch where he again talks about this. And one of the things that he mentioned is that, you know, Roosevelt for the most part kept his own counsel. Uh, and so there's not really any documents that we have that talks about his internal thought process um, into making this decision. And of course he didn't write a memoir because he dies in office. So we don't have that to, to look back on and try to get a sense of, you know, why he he made this decision. So the best thing that we can actually find to really get into why he did this um, is the comments that he made um, to the Democratic National Convention um, in 1940. Um, and so I excerpted, um, I linked to the full uh, document in the newsletter, but I excerpted a couple pieces here and I, I want us to think about again, what this tells us about what led him to make this decision. Uh, and so I'm not gonna read the full thing. I just wanna kind of point out a couple of uh, pieces that he talks about here. Of course, he starts off talking about, you know, the, the things that the country is doing um, to implement defense measures. Uh, and he says, I cannot forget that in carrying out this program, I have drafted into the service of the nation, many men and women, taking them away from important private affairs, calling them suddenly from their homes and their businesses. Um, and then, you know, he goes on to talk about, you know, lying awake at night. I've asked myself whether I have the right as commander in chief of the army and Navy to call on men and women to serve their country. And at the same time to decline to serve my country in my own personal capacity, if I'm called upon to do so by the people of this country. And then he kind of concludes this kind of, uh, you know, why he's saying he's doing this is saying that his conscience will not let him turn his back upon the call of duty. Um, and so again, he's really tying this into like, I, and he, you know, in his comments, if you look at the full speech, he talks about, you know, he'd been planning his retirement. He'd been looking forward to it. Um, you know, he could not, you know, a man his age who'd served his time, like he was ready to like, you know, go and live a life of leisure. But again, we're at this moment of war. 
Um, we see that things are going to get worse in Europe, um, and he just feels that it would be um, shirking of his duty um, as, a, as a, an American citizen, especially as president, to walk away. So you can have students, again, kind of, you know, look through uh, his comments here and analyze those and, again, really think about, you know, is the argument he is making, is it compelling? Um, does it really explain why he made this decision? Of course, not everyone was gung-ho about, uh, you know, FDR making this call. Uh, and I found two really cool sources that kind of get into this argument about why it was bad that he was running for a third term. Um, one of them is uh, this uh, ad here that is from uh, a newspaper, and I can't remember off the top of my head what the paper was, um, that is a nonpartisan group. Uh, and so, you know, they talk at the very, very bottom here about how they're not Democrats, they're not Republicans, they're just a group of people interested in upholding constitutional conventions. Um, and you see here at the top of the thing that jumps out at you is no dictator for the United States. And so they're making this argument that in, by running for a third term, that this is a step towards dictatorship. And of course, if we think about that in the larger context of what was happening in Europe with dictators and fascism, um, you can see how that might be a compelling argument to oppose FDR. The other source um, that you could get into and read, um, this is from the Republican National Committee. Um, and so again, very similar arguments, right? A third term opens the door to dictatorship. So we see again, that, that is a common theme in this argument against what FDR is doing. Um, of course, this talks about, again, you know, the the standard by, set by Washington and Jefferson and others uh, to not run for a third term. Uh, why having a third term and staying in power too long is dangerous. Um, I find it really interesting here when you get to this uh, fourth point that it ends with talking about we don't want four more years of X. Uh, Corconian, uh, Hopkins, and Madam Perkins. So, of course, uh, you know, we did some stuff on Francis Perkins not too long ago. So, again, they wanted to get those folks out too. Um, so, you know, have students uh, look at these, analyze them, think about again, what is the argument that people are making, um, again, about why running for a third term is dangerous for the country. Of course, we know he does win, um, not just a third term, but actually a fourth term, uh, dies in office in 1945. Um, and shortly thereafter, there is uh, efforts by uh, from the Republican-controlled Congress to start conversations about a constitutional amendment to prevent, uh, to institute term limits um, for presidents. So there is an interesting editorial that I found. This is from 1947. So this is about the time that the, again, the momentum for the 22nd Amendment or what will become the 22nd Amendment really starts going. And I thought this was interesting to have students look at because it actually kind of outlines the arguments um, in favor of term limits and those opposed to them. And so, um, you know, you can see here, it says the pros held that un the unlimited tenure of office invites an over-concentration of power sets up an irresponsible bureaucracy and stifles the normal growth of presidential timber within the party in control. And the anti said that a two-term limit would be imposing this generation's will upon future generations who might find it necessary in an emergency to continue a president in office beyond two terms. They held that it was more democratic to allow the voters to choose whom they please for the president. So again, really kind of again laying out the arguments that we see represented both from FDR's time and then have again followed through over the course of the next seven years. Um, and again, I think this is a great way to have students think about, you know, how um, his decision was a turning point, how it led to the 22nd Amendment. Where do we find, what do we find compelling in these arguments? Um, and do these arguments, I mean, is this still something we should consider? Because there, you know, of course, have been some discussions at different points about do we, should we overturn the 22nd Amendment? Um, so with that said, again, I thought this is really interesting for something, again, we don't think a lot about. We just assume it as like this matter of fact that he did this and it, it turned to a constitutional amendment. Um, but in itself is actually a pretty interesting story. So again, hopefully you guys can use some of these sources with your students uh, and really kind of, again, dig into this uh, and find it, you know, maybe as interesting as I did. So, all right. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Ken. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, oh, happy sorry. I'm, I'm I forgot to introduce Ken at the very beginning of this webcast, by the way. Sorry. 
Uh, Ken Mosher is one of our graduate research assistants with TPS for this year. He is also a current teacher of many subjects, including U.S. history, at Siegel High School here in Murfreesboro. And this is his very first digging in. So please welcome Ken. And in typical very first fashion, I didn't know to prepare a PowerPoint, but I will next time uh, because I do love a good PowerPoint and it's one of my favorite things to do. Um, so I uh, very much look forward to being able to spend some time doing that. Um, so my topic for digging in was the confrontation at City Hall between Mayor Ben West and Diane Nash. And I chose this particular moment because for me, a turning point is not just the beginning of something, but a change in momentum, the inflection point uh, where something that has been building from various directions uh, coalesces into a single point that then moves forward from there. And one of the unfortunate things is even in the Tennessee state standards for social studies at the high school level, um, Nashville is present in terms of the civil rights movement, but it doesn't uh, occupy near the place that it rightfully deserves um, as really a nexus of the types of thinking and leadership that's going to push the civil rights forward through the rest of the 60s. So the basic setup for the confrontation is that uh, the home of a prominent Nashville lawyer is typically just how he's referenced. Uh, Z. Alexander Luby is bombed uh, in the middle of the night. He and his wife both survive, but the bombing triggers a march by uh, two students, fifth student Diane Nash and uh, American Baptist uh, college student C.T. Vivian um, and thousands of other Nashville residents to the steps of City Hall to demand an answer for what should be done next from uh, Mayor Ben West. And the famous moment is basically where Diane asked him face to face, is it wrong to, or to segregate on the basis of someone's race? And she backs Ben West into a corner where he says, essentially, I answer as a man that yes, it is wrong, um, which uh, has an entire box of goodies to unpack in and of itself. Um, but I think there, is a little bit more even here that should be noted. Um, Luby himself is not just a figure appearing um, as a prominent attorney in Nashville whose home is randomly bombed. Um, this is a man who was an immigrant with his family to the United States who attended prestigious universities, including Howard, eventually earning a law degree, was uh, one of the founders of Kent College of Law in Nashville, which was the first African-American college of law since 1911. Uh, he was head of the African-American Bar Association in Nashville. He was hired by the NAACP in 1946 alongside names uh, such as Thurgood Marshall to represent African-Americans accused of murder in the Columbia riots. Um, he is responsible for desegregating before this moment. Uh, Nashville's golf courses, the uh, uh, dining room at the Nashville airport. Uh, he was integral to uh, pushing Nashville towards school uh, desegregation in 1957, following Brown v. Board of Education, even though that only uh, ends up being the infamous step-up program that Nashville will implement and other Southern cities will uh, emulate. And then finally here in 1960, we find him supporting the sit-in activists of the Nashville student movement. Um, and it is uh, that support in part um, that gets his home bombed. So the importance here is, yes, you have a Southern mayor binding himself to desegregation, at least as a man and not as a politician, which again is an interesting choice of words. He can't as a politician, um, a prominent Southern politician, but he can step back from that role, step out of the office momentarily and claim a moralistic stance as a man. Um, yes, that changes momentum for other Southern cities on being asked to come to the same reckoning but really it is the cast of individuals that this moment is bringing together that will fan out across the rest of the 60s uh, to fundamentally change the way the movement is handled. Um, Diane Nash and C.T. Vivian are just a part alongside James Lawson of uh, Vanderbilt Divinity School. Um, John Lewis, probably the most recognizable of the names, uh, also of American Baptist. James Bevel of American Baptist. Um, all of these individuals are in training with each other to drive forward the policy of nonviolence that will come to characterize the entire decade. Um, and it catches the eyes at the time 
of the greatest names in the rights movement. Martin Luther King Jr. himself caused the Nashville movement the best organized and most disciplined organization in the Southland. Many of these individuals, Vivian uh, Lewis Bevel will go out to lead uh, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, and many others spreading the influence of what happened in Nashville far and wide. So the brief parenthetical mention of Nashville in regards to the sit-ins in the Tennessee Standard listed on the lesson plan is but a beginning. And this is a point that you could really teach the entire civil rights movement around looking backwards to the events that give rise to the importance of uh, men like Luby, and then looking forward to what Diane Nash will do in the Freedom Rides, um, what uh, Bevel and uh, Vivian will do in SNCC and the SCLC. For the specific sources that I included in my lesson plan, I tried to uh, reach out and take multiple perspectives, um, both contemporary newspaper articles, which lay bare the fact that Nashvilleans saw this as an embarrassment. Um, Mayor West himself uh, vocalizes a common belief uh, among Tennesseans that even if desegregation was not something that they personally were in favor of in Tennessee, as Wes says, the law will be enforced. Um, and in that reference, he's specifically talking about uh, Brown v. Board of Education. But of course, that's going to be of particular importance for Tennesseans once other laws like the Civil Rights Act of 1964 is handed down. I also included modern uh, newspaper articles looking backward at the significance of the moment, the significance of the individuals to get a sense of how we view this today. Um, and if we teach it in quite the same way, uh, I don't think we necessarily do. And having students pick that apart and find the nuances in language between contemporary newspapers of the time and modern newspapers is always a great exercise. The Centerpiece source, though, the interview with Ben West and with Diane Nash provides a treasure trove of things to uh, unlock with students, um, pausing intermittently throughout the video as they make their various statements where they show empathy with each other, but also where they make some quite conditional statements. Ben West, again, uh, leaning in on the idea that he is taking these stances as a man and not as a Southern politician. And then my suggestion going forward from there, if you wanted to expand on this and the students are really digging into it themselves, would be to uh, break them into groups and assign each group one of those leaders and let the group trace where they're going to take the movement from here. Um, so yeah, I was intrigued by this. Um, I know in high school, I didn't get taught the importance of Nashville in the movement. Um, and I couldn't help but chuckle uh, this past weekend. My wife and I uh, went to dinner in Nashville. And along the way, I passed the Bend West Municipal Building, Diane Nash Plaza, and Representative uh, John Lewis Way, uh, all on the way to dinner. Um, all of these personalities intertwined in a quite apparent memory, if you just know where to look. And so with that, I think I'm passing it off now to Stacy. All right. Well, thank you very much, kid. I am going to be talking about historic preservation. We here at the Center for Historic Preservation do that kind of thing from time to time. And so this is one of those opportunities that allowed me to combine uh, what I'm doing uh, in, in, in those projects and classes with what we're doing uh, in TPS. And so I am going to quickly show you what the lesson idea looks like in the newsletter. And then I do have a very short PowerPoint. I do have to tell you, Ken, I almost never do PowerPoints for these. I usually just follow links from the document itself. I just, um, for some reason, I thought I would impress Kira today and make a PowerPoint, so. <laughs> Okay, um, now to take a look. All right, so I was trying to think of a turning point with historic preservation, uh, especially since I'd been talking about these things with some of our students in public history. 
And so I zeroed in on the Antiquities Act of 1906, which is usually something that students never learn about in high school or even in college or even in their entire lives. But um, it's actually important for um, what it does itself, but more so the legacy that it creates for the tradition of federally sponsored historic preservation programs in the United States. And so I talk a bit about that in this first paragraph and how it really sets the stage for the really, really big landmark legislation in 1966 which is the National Historic Preservation Act. And that's the one that creates the National Register of Historic Places, which most people have heard of, and a lot of the other uh, things that have uh, more of a, a felt impact. Um, it also sets the stage for the 1990 Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, or NAGPRA. Uh, and we I talk about that uh, in a, in a, at a bit more length and a featured feature of one of our previous newsletters on material culture. And so that's where that link will take you, um, which is very important for protecting uh, Native American cultural items and making sure that those stay with the tribes or are returned to the tribes. And of course, there's a lot of cases with museums and university holdings today that are still kind of pending um, with this act. And the whole question is, well, there's lots of different questions here, but um, who owns these sites? Who has a right to these sites? And what are these sites supposed to be used for? Um, and so this act says they're supposed to be used for the public good, which is... Um, 10 years after the Antiquities Act, going to be espoused in the creation of the National Park Service, which I think we're all uh, pretty familiar with. So why is the Antiquities Act of 1906, which nobody's heard of, um, a turning point? It is the first federal historic preservation legislation. And sometimes, Picking a piece of legislation may seem really boring to students, but legislation has a power to really impact what can and cannot be done in our daily lives, as well as um, you know, what the country can do in terms of creating things like national parks and national monuments. So I do have a number of links embedded in this first paragraph. I'm not gonna go to all of them, uh, but I do want to, uh, show you some of them. But for right now, I'm gonna start my PowerPoint. I'm just gonna move that over there. Slideshow. Okay, so um, what you are looking at right now, does anyone recognize this feature in the landscape? Does anyone know what it is? If you know, put it in the chat box. And yes, an acceptable answer is that place where the aliens meet Richard Dreyfus in Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Because that's the first time I have to admit I ever saw this because I saw that movie as a kid. And so when I look at this, I hear that near, 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 sorry. Um, but uh, this is, did anybody write it in the chat box? Yeah, what is it? so Devil's Tower in Wyoming is... Yes, um, it is Devil's Tower in Wyoming. It is a very odd rock formation, uh, a very high butte, I believe, and it has been used as a landmark by people for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And for obvious reasons, you can see it for about 100 miles away. And this is today, it's, well, it's, it's protected by the federal government. And this is the very first site that was created a national monument 
um, by the Antiquities Act because the Antiquities Act did a couple things. One thing is it allows the president to establish national monuments on public lands. And so um, a lot of these national monuments uh, you have heard of. <laughs> Some of them, maybe not. A lot of them are out West. Why? Because at this time in American history, there is a lot of public land out West owned by the government. And a lot of this land had been taken from Native American tribes. And so there's a lot of natural and culturally important to Native American sites on this land. And you have a lot of people moving west, of course, like they had for decades before this, explorers, settlers, people looking to make a quick buck, people who are just very curious and uh, people who are Curious to the point that when they come across an archeological site and they find really cool stuff there, they dig it up and they take it home and they sell it. Okay, excuse me. Um, to, sometimes they sell it to museums even, or they sell it to private collectors. And so a lot of Native American material culture uh, was just indiscriminately being taken out of these sites because, well, for one thing, the field of archaeology wasn't completely professionalized in the United States. So there wasn't this kind of public acceptance of proper ways to treat artifacts. And this is just kind of what people did. But there was a growing movement uh, there, a conservation movement in the United States started in the mid 19th century um, with the idea that places of outstanding natural beauty or cultural significance should be protected by the government for the public good. And so there was this growing sentiment, this does not come out of nowhere. Turning points never just occur out of nowhere. So part of your process is what led up to this. Um, but one thing that this does is it creates penalties for people who remove archaeological objects from these sites that are designated as national monuments. So it's the first one that kind of protects cultural heritage. Now, unfortunately, the language about that is kind of vague. And so it doesn't really do as much protection from looting as it hoped to. And it actually has to be superseded in 1979 um, by the Archaeological Resources Protection Act, ARPA, which will then uh, have much clearer and much more enforceable penalties for that kind of looting. Um, so it allows the president to create national monuments on public lands, and it is supposed to protect uh, the looting of the um, kind of archeological items because there's a sense that we can learn things from these. We can appreciate them for education and recreation. And so this is very much a progressive era spirit here. Uh, and who's our favorite progressive era president? <laughs> Theodore Roosevelt, uh, or he's my favorite progressive era president, um, shown here with John Muir uh, standing at Yosemite. Um, he is president, and of course, he has quite a reputation for being in favor of environmental conservation. Uh, he is behind the creation of the first uh, national park, which is Yellowstone in Wyoming. And uh, Yosemite comes not too long after, and that's in California. And so uh, he right away creates like 18 different sites during his term. And he would have created more if he had gotten a third term, but uh, alas. So, and a lot of these sites will become national parks later on or parts of different kind of units of the National Park Service. Because another way in which this act is significant 
is, and I'm quoting from the National Park Service here, it is the original authority for more than one in every four units in the national parks system. So in other words, more than 25% of the sites that were created as national monuments under this act will be expanded into national parks later on and are there are still there today. So um, it, it was very important for identifying and preserving at the early part of the 20th century, a lot of these sites that we can still enjoy today. Okay. So let's take a look at some of the language, not all of it, of course. Um, there are links uh, to the act itself, of course, being an act of Congress, you can find it in the congressional record on the Library of Congress website. Um, it, its formal name is an act for the preservation of American antiquities. Now it doesn't define what makes something an antiquity, how old it has to be or something like that, but baby steps, right? So I am going to bring out, um, oh man, and of course all of the Zoom things are covering this. So I'm trying to, okay, moving it so I can read this. So this is just uh, two of these paragraphs uh, from part of the conversation about this bill in Congress, and I'm just gonna read it. The bill as amended will, in the opinion of your committee, accomplish the purpose desired. There are scattered throughout the Southwest quite a large number of very interesting ruins. Many of these ruins are upon the public lands and most of them are upon lands of but little present value. The bill proposes to create small reservations, reserving only so much land as may be absolutely necessary for the preservation of these interesting relics of prehistoric times. Practically every civilized government in the world has enacted laws for the preservation of the remains of the historic past and has provided that excavations and explorations shall be conducted in some systematic and practical way so as not to needlessly destroy buildings and other objects of interest. So one thing I like that it points out is that all these other countries, which you know they're thinking about Western first world countries here, of course, have already created laws. But America in 1906 is still a young country. America doesn't have any ancient history in its history. It has to reach into the Native American past to start feeling a connection to the prehistoric past or ancient history, what antiquities are. They're not a legacy of the colonists, they are a legacy of the people who were here before. And so that's one way in which America is very different and developed a very different idea towards saving antique sites because there's a disconnect in cultural heritage. Um, so you can discuss this wording with your students to be like, okay, so why do they think that this would be easy? Not a problem, right? Um, well, for one thing, the the land is public, so you don't have to worry about messing with private property rights. And for another thing, the land is of little present value. So what do you think they mean by little present value? You know, value for what? Um, so they're they're probably talking about for where white people want to settle. Uh, and whether or not, you know, they can be profitable for extractive industries or whether or not it looks like someplace you would want to put a railroad through. Now, these things will happen later on, of course, uh, in a lot of different instances. Uh, but for, for right now, uh, they're just seeing wide swaths of desert lands. And they're like, well, there's nothing else we can do with this. And it's got some interesting stuff on it. So let's protect it. It's not going to be a hard choice for us. It's not like we have to choose between um, a way to profit off of this land or sacrifices that white people would have to make in settling there because they wouldn't. Um, so it, it it definitely still fits within kind of the cultural movements of the time. All right, so let's take a look at what are some of these sites besides 
uh, Devil's Tower. And um, that, of course, is a name given to it by white people. <laughs> it's, 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 it's got a Native American name that is much more appropriate that I, I can't remember off the top of my head right now. But um, so the lesson idea identifies four of these earliest national monuments, four of the five earliest ones that were ever created under this act. Uh, three of these are from 1906, and one of them is from 1907. And so what are, and so, uh, yeah, the Library of Congress has a lot of images of each of these. So students can look through the images that are linked from the lesson idea, and they can look at the information about these sites in the National Park Service web pages. So those are what are linked. Okay. So the first one, of course, is Devil's Tower in Wyoming. This is a natural site. So this protects um, items of both natural interest and what they call scientific interest. So here we have um, Devil's Tower, which is a natural formation. So, and then uh, Montezuma Castle, of course it's not a castle and it has nothing to do with Montezuma, but again, uh, so this was built, this is a really good example of a cliff dwelling. It was built in like the 12th century um, by distant, distant ancestors of the Navajo and other tribes. And um, so this would be considered a scientifically interesting site because of the data that it can yield for archeologists and finding out about early cultures and how they lived. Um, the third site is Petrified Forest in Arizona, which has these fabulous uh, formations uh, that look like rocks, but were once trees. And um, I, some of you may have already been to the Petrified Forest. I have, I have not actually stopped in the Petrified Forest. I drove through it once, but I didn't stop there. But uh, it's definitely something I want to go see one day. Um, this, of course, being a back in the natural interest category. And then the fourth example is another scientifically interesting one because it's an archeological site, uh, Chaco Canyon, which now is, um, it's not called Chaco Canyon. Uh, it's actually a number of sites that are kind of, it kind of covers uh, like over a thousand acres. And so there are some main uh, building sites and then some what they call outliers. So there's actually like three dozen different smaller sites that all together make up this very large site, which is now also not only a, a national park, but a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Uh, so it is deemed of universal importance to the human race because of what it tells us about um, how these people live. Now, this would have been uh, from like the 10th century. Uh, so this is created like when the Carolingian Empire was ruling parts of Europe. So it's incredible uh, to have such wonderfully intact sites of this level of antiquity in the United States um, and being protected at such an early date. Um, this is the this is the one that has all the different kind of round formations called kivas, which are different ritual sites. There's just hundreds and hundreds of them. So, um, but it's now called uh, Chaco Culture National or National Monument. So uh, those are the four different sites, and I'm going to excuse me. Try to I'm going to try to. Uh, get out of the Google slides, but uh, I don't know how. How do I get out of here? Exit slideshow. Okay, and and I am going to go back to the website just to finish up in a few minutes what we are looking at. So you can see that for each of these four different sites, uh, it links to images and resources. So the images would our um, search results at the Library of Congress um, so that students can look at, for example, a number of different 
photographs, uh, some of which are kind of older black and white sepia tone, um, because there were a lot of explorers that, you know, thought this was awesome right away. So there's a lot of uh, photographs from like William Henry Jackson and John Grable and other very important people in this movement back then um, from the turn of the century. And then, of course, uh, Carol Highsmith, our favorite Library of Congress photographer, has uh, been there more recently and, and created some wonderful color photographs that are all public domain. Uh, so there are a lot of different images that students can look at. Um, and then the resources page, like I said, takes the students to where they can read more about it um, on the National Park Service website. And so basically you can ask them about how is this site significant? Why would you want to save this site for the public good? And what can it tell us, you know, of, or how can we enjoy it both educationally and recreationally of natural interest and scientific interest? And so um, you can also, uh, okay, so some of the links that were in that first contextual paragraph, um, Particularly, there's just the little word act uh, that is underlined, it's easy to miss. But if you click on that, you have a really nice short four paragraph long overview of this act that would be a really good thing to make students read because it goes over significance and it talks about some of the legacy of why this act is important. And then students can really use this language to discuss, uh, to, to make their arguments and their claim, which they have to do for a History Day project. Um, and there's also a link to a timeline. Uh, the Old American Memory site had this exhibit called the American Conservation Movement. And it, they had a whole collection actually. And it's hard to get to now because they changed the website so much in the intervening years. So this, I, it was hard for me to find this link, but I found it and now you can find it much more easily. Just click on it from my, my website. But um, there is a timeline which begins in 1847 and ends in the with 1920. And this is for the page 1901 to 1907. So this will can really give students context for what's going on, all the different uh you know, things that are happening as part of this conservation movement, how, uh, you know, there are policies created, what's the political action, what are authors doing, what are explorers doing, um, what is the pulse of the country in terms of being more aware of the importance of these sites. Uh, so, you know, what's John Muir doing, for example? So yeah, you can see already in 1906, um, there's a link to the Antiquities Act right there. Okay, oh yeah. And then uh, there are several maps at the Library of Congress uh, that you can also show students if you if you want to give them a sense of just what the West looked like to white people back east at this time uh, in the 19th century and, and why it seemed so wide open to them and how it was that they went about exploring it, um, et cetera. And so uh, this one right here is a really good map. I don't have it linked to in the lesson idea itself, um, but if you just kind of search for map the territory of the United States from 1858, you'll find it and there are some similar ones too. So I'm gonna stop sharing and throw this back to Kira to talk a bit more about resources. Thank you, Stacey. Um, so one thing that uh, Stacey mentioned, of course, when she was talking about our theme for this month, uh, is that we did pick turning points uh, in U.S. history for a very specific reason. And one of that is our increased involvement uh, with the History Day program, specifically uh, with Middle Tennessee, uh, the Regional History Day uh, contest. So um, 
we, uh, and by we, I mean the Center for Historic Preservation and myself will now be the regional coordinator um, for the Middle Tennessee contest. And so we wanted to, again, start thinking about how we could share some resources and materials from our Teaching with Primary Sources program to help some people who might be involved in History Day um, or uh, to get people who maybe aren't as familiar with History Day, uh, introduce them to that wonderful program uh, and so that they can find some resources. So... Let me pull up um, the newsletter real quick. I just want to point out a couple of things as we get ready to wrap up here. Um, so in the featured feature, um, you'll see, uh, you know, again, we have a little article here about uh, the History Day program. Let me make that a little bigger so you guys can see it better. Um, so there's a link to uh, the Tennessee History Day program uh, website, which, of course, the Tennessee Historical Society runs. We have tons of wonderful links and resources there on that website. So if you uh, are interested in kind of some overviews, uh, resources, that kind of stuff, you can uh, check out that web page. Um, if you're curious, if you are part of the Middle Tennessee region, um, we did include the map and you can find the full state map on um, the website I just mentioned. Um, but you can see the counties that we will cover. And so the, if you are a teacher in one of those counties, you would actually come here um, to MTSU to compete in the regional contest. And then of course, winners from that uh, will then go on to compete at the state level. Um, this is a competition for middle and high school students, so students must be in grades 6 through 12, um, so kind of keep that in mind, but it doesn't necessarily have to be Tennessee or even U.S. history related. Again, we just kind of focus it on U.S. history because that's where the Library of Congress has the best stuff. Um, I also linked to uh, a video and some other materials that National History Day has. Uh, so again, if this is something you're interested in and you want to introduce this idea of like what is a turning point in history, there's a great uh, video that they have out that again kind of walks through how we define turning points in history, what are some examples. It's a really great way to kind of get students started. Um, so definitely check that out. Um, and then there are a number of wonderful um, resources uh, that you can find uh, through this link right here, which will take you um, to this Padlet that uh, Nikki Ward, who is the state coordinator, has created. And again, this is like any material that you might ever need to actually implement History Day um, in your classroom. So that is a really great resource to look at. Um, we will be sharing information about uh, History Day um, via our TPS MTSU Facebook page. Um, so if you haven't uh, liked or haven't followed our page, I recommend you do so. You'll note that uh, about once or twice a week, we're going to be sharing some posts with information related to History Day there. Um, we are also doing uh, a little newsletter for any educators who are either already planning to participate in History Day or are history day curious um so if you would like to get that that is going to be a separate piece that we'll send out um let me know and we can get you added to that mailing list um so again this is just kind of some resources um for history day um but in addition to that you know we do link to um a number of other and i really thought of this as more of some of our uh my favorite i think i, I put most of these things in here so these are most of my favorite resources we've created over the years that really uh, speak to some really important events in U.S. history. Um, so such as uh, the lesson plan that we have on Reconstruction of the 14th Amendment, um, the lesson plan that we have related to the 19th Amendment and the National Woman's Party. Um, this really cool uh, lesson plan about uh, World War II and the atomic bomb. Um, this was created by one of our teachers in residence um, several years ago. Uh, we have a couple of different close readings. Uh, Stacy did one for us uh, a year or so ago now on Thomas Jefferson's letter, letter to the Danbury Baptist, which uh, is one of uh, a favorite. Um, we have one on the Dred Scott decision. Uh, we mentioned, uh, or well, uh, we have a lesson on the Boston Massacre. We'll be doing a lot more on the American Revolution next month. Uh, <laughs> so if you're interested in that, um, we, we, our whole newsletter next month is on the American Revolution. And then some things related to, of course, to the Civil War, because uh, I'm sure that that is a turning point that many students uh, would would think about early on when you think about turning points in U.S. history. And so, I was actually, sorry, but I, just when you were saying those, I could think of more that we've done. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we have a lesson plan on the Russian Revolution. We have um, 
a, you know, a lesson plan on the Emancipation Proclamation. We have newsletters that we did on landmark Supreme Court cases. So if you're thinking along the lines of Dred Scott, there's like four more in a, in a whole newsletter because those are always good turning points. Even our historic epidemics, you know, mm -hmm. uh, would be, and I got these ideas when I was reading that booklet that you linked to in that featured feature from the National History Day about it, the theme. Uh, and that booklet also has a really good article about using Chronicling America from the Library of Congress. Yes. Um, so yeah, definitely check that out if again, if you're interested in History Day or if you're just interested in having your kids do, um, you know, some sort of history research project. Um, and maybe you want to circle, you know, center it around a theme like turning points. There's some really great, um, again, information resources that you could use to, again, build that kind of research project uh, for your students. So um, a couple quick things as we get ready to uh, close out. Uh, again, we will put uh, all of the resources from today's session on the Padlet. Um, so be sure to check that out. Um, if you're interested in receiving uh, PD credit for today's session, be sure to complete the webinar or the, uh, the survey for uh, that we see here. So you can use the QR code, you can use the link. Uh, either way, we send these out about once a week. So fill them out and then um, you should get your certificate via email uh, within about seven days. Uh, we will be um, uh, back next month on the second Thursday of the month, which is November the 9th. And as I mentioned, our theme for next month is the American Revolution. Um, so we're going uh, to explore that period. We've been spending a lot of time thinking about it as both of our, the books that we're reading for virtual book clubs this semester are related to that time period. So we've spent a lot of time uh, there in the late 18th century here lately. So with that, again, we want to thank you guys for joining us today, and we hope to see you next month.